don't say. Sure, we'll keep an eye on, on our emails for you. Okay. Andy W, that'll be your uh, that'll be your tune. There you go, man. You're up. <laughs> Okay, so that's live on Facebook, on YouTube. Okay. And it's now recording. Okay, we'll kick off at seven. Okay, uh, by my timepiece, it's seven o'clock, so I'm gonna start the meeting. Uh, good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us tonight. This meeting is being recorded and will be live streamed on YouTube. Please bear with us if there are any technical issues. The minutes will be posted on our website as usual. Uh, a few housekeeping points. Just to let you know that all participants will be muted unless asked to speak. We have 32 attendees registered today. So please can I ask all attendees to pose their questions or comments through the Q&A board at the bottom of your screen. You won't be on video, but you can be seen in name by councillors and staff. Attendees' names will become visible on the questions board for the record if their question is answered. We only have one item on the agenda tonight, and following that, I will then ask Rachel for any moderated questions and comments from the public. We only have an hour and a half tonight, so please can I ask that you keep your comments as brief as possible and try not to repeat what has already been said. I will then ask councillors for any comments by raising their blue hands, and I will come to each of you in turn. When voting, can councillors similarly raise your blue hand until the vote has been recorded by Peter. Peter will clerk this evening, Laura will take the minutes, Rachel and Sarah will manage the questions board and the participants settings. Uh, we're operating this meeting as a safe space this evening, so please be mindful of other people's views and ensure that all discussion is through the chair. I know feelings are running high, but please let's keep this as good natured as we possibly can. I'm gonna to try to hold to an 8.30 finish this evening, and we'll be aiming to split the meeting into two halves. In the first half, I'd like to take questions and comments from the public, and the second half will be devoted to Froome Town Councillors. I would like to remind anyone from the public that we have received numerous statements and emails all of which have been taken into account. So your views are already on record. We also have the public consultation meeting last week where many of you were able to put your views across. In order to manage this meeting effectively as we'll only have limited time for public comments and questions, I'm therefore keen that we hear from those who have not yet had their voice heard. In the final part of the meeting, as I said, I will give way to councillors for their questions and comments. It's important that councillors are given this time to openly air their questions and comments without interruption. Having had our discussion and taking all your comments this evening into consideration, we will then be in a position to submit our decision regarding supporting or objecting to this plan. I hope that's acceptable to everyone. So let's start the evening by apologies for absence and declaration of councillors' interest, please. Do we have any uh, absence? Um, notifications? Does anyone know? No? Okay. No. Uh, and declaration of councillors' interest, please. Is there anyone who'd like to declare an interest? Ali, Mark, uh, Sheila. Uh, Ali, in that order, please. And then Laura. Yeah, I need to declare a pecuniary interest in Frico, so I won't be part of the discussion. Okay, and I think I turn off my video. Thank you, Ali. Uh, Mark? I also have a personal interest as a share, very, very small shareholder in Frico. Thank you, Mark. And uh, Sheila, you had a comment? Yes, similarly, I have a personal interest in Frico. I have some shares with that company. Thank you. Uh, I saw Rich's hand up and then uh, Lizzie and Laura. Uh, Can I go to yeah. Laura first? Sorry. Apologies, there was um, apologies from Sarah Butler. Just wanted to note those. Thank you, Laura. Um, Rich and then Lizzie. Uh, yeah, I'm a free co shareholder. I've only got £250 worth. It may be £500 if you include my wife. <coughs> I can't quite remember. But I give all my dividends to the community fund. So uh, I make no 
profit out of this. I'm also a trustee of Friends of the River Froome for Clarity, who may well or may not be a consultee or a pressure group. I'm also uh, a trustee of Miss Froome's Missing Links, who may be consulted on the cycle path proposals. And I'm also a SUS Trans volunteer. Of course, that may be, have, have some impact uh, on, on the national cycle network. There may be possible changes on that, but I'm, I'm basically an active member of the community. Thank, Thank you, you Richard. Okay. Um, Lizzie. Um, and I declare a personal interest as a director of FRECO, just to clarify what that, why that matters or why that's pertinent to the discussion. Um, FRECO is Froome Renewable Energy Cooperative, which is a local cooperative promoting renewable energy around town. You'll have seen our solar panels on the solar panels on the medical practice and the football club. Um, and FRECO has been in discussion with LVA and their consultants about um, opportunities for solar PV schemes um, around the, the development. Thank you. Okay. Um, Paul, could I just check with you? Are all these councillors except Ali able to vote this evening and take part? Um, Peter's clerking, but, but yes, anyone with a personal interest as declared was able to take part in the discussion and vote. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Peter. Okay. Um, uh, sorry, uh, Anisha, can I just also declare a personal yeah, interest? Sure. Um, I, I'm also um, a member of Extinction Rebellion in Froome and uh, play a leading part in that from time to time. So. Okay. Um, thank you. Okay, I think that covers all declarations of interest. Um, we're now going to go to comments and questions from the public and councillors on any issues not related to Selwood Garden community, because that will come later. So if there are any other questions or comments you'd like to make about anything else, now is your time. Nothing else coming up? No blue hands? No, we don't have any questions there, Rachel? No, no questions. Okay, thank you. So the format of the evening now then is we're going to listen to the presentation from Jane Llewellyn, who is the planning manager at Quintine Council, followed by a presentation from Chris Bennett from Selwood Parish Council. Then we'll take questions and comments from the public, and then we'll have questions and comments from the councillors. So Jane, if I could hand over to you for your presentation, please. Thank you, Anita. Hopefully you'll have all had the opportunity to read through the report and the appendices. I won't go through the report word for word, but I will give you a summary. Um, and Flora, if we could have the slide showing the proposal, please. Thank you. So, so this is just to remind you all, I'm sure you are familiar with it, but just what the proposal is all about. Uh, so mixed use development, to the south of Froome that will comprise around 1,700 new dwellings, employment land, a local centre and other social and physical infrastructure with a potential solar farm on land to the east of the main residential development to generate renewable energy to power the new homes. I'll start with the process so far. The, the first public consultation by LVA was in December 2019. The Town Council's response to that was based on the vision, core objectives and policies contained within the Froome Neighbourhood Plan. A full copy of our response is attached at Appendix 1 to the report. This was followed by a series of three meetings of the South West Design Review Panel, who were engaged by LVA um, and included the Town District and the County Council Highways team. And the aim of that review panel is to improve design quality and its role is to review development proposals and provide feedback to the developers and to local authorities. The second public consultation by LVA, the one that we're responding to now, began on the 25th of September. And this was an online consultation due to the current COVID restrictions. But before we considered our response, we wanted to ensure that people were informed about proposals and that we were aware of how residents felt about them so we arranged for LVA to give an online presentation of their proposals with a Q&A session at the end. This was then followed by a second meeting where residents had the opportunity to discuss various topics and give us their feedback. And a full summary of all that feedback is attached to this report at Appendix 2. It's clear from that feedback that most people felt that the proposal is too big for Froome, 
and that Froome does not need that amount of new houses. There's concern about the loss of a large amount of green fields, the impact that will have on wildlife and the impact of the additional traffic on the road. These were the main concerns, but I want to assure everybody that has commented all of the concerns raised either at the meeting or by email have been recorded, including all the emails that have been sent directly to councillors, which have been forwarded to me as well. I said at the last meeting uh, that I'd ask Mendit to confirm the housing numbers for Froome and that I'd confirm those numbers at this meeting. So if we could have the next slide, please, Laura. I'm sorry, it's not a very exciting slide, um, but those are the numbers as they were provided by Mendip. And Mendip have stressed that the numbers referred to are described as a minimum of. So you'll see that taking into account all of the developments that have already been built, that have permission and are waiting to be started, and the sites that will be allocated once part two of the local plan is adopted during the lifetime of the local plan, which runs from 2006 to 2029, Broome will have had to have provided a minimum of 200, sorry, 2,882 new houses. So it is correct to say that there is no evidence based on the local plan figures that Froome needs to provide any more housing. However, Mendip as a district does need to provide more houses. And they've also confirmed that Mendip are now working to a government imposed figure and have to provide an additional 600 houses per year across the district. And that is why they can't demonstrate a five year land supply. And there's a very real risk that piecemeal developments will be approved. And this is something that we would want to avoid. As I've said in the report, this could be a particular problem for Froome. There is access to jobs, services, and public transport links, being, being the only town in Mendip that has a train station. And Mendip have also stated in their local plan part two, that Froome is the largest of the Mendip towns and has good prospects for growth and delivery. We know from experience that objecting to applications doesn't always lead to applications being refused, which is why it's important at this pre-application cons consultation stage, when we still have the opportunity to shape proposals, that we say what we think still needs to be addressed. Bearing all, the, all of the above in mind, I've set out a proposed response and highlighted the areas where we feel that there are issues that need to be addressed before the planning application is submitted, which I'll now summarise. And if Laura could just pop up the next slide for me. Thank you. Um, so what, what I've said in the report is we are not fundamentally opposed, <clears throat> excuse me, to a town extension that creates an opportunity to provide much needed facilities and infrastructure for the town. But before we can either support or object to the proposals, we need to see and evaluate the detailed reports that will be submitted as part of the outline application. We would also want to have discussions with the key service providers to understand their thoughts and requirements. Transport is one issue where the approach needs to be more radical. It should not be based around the car and provide easier walking and cycling routes, better public transport opportunities, making car travel more of a challenge. We're particularly concerned. Oh, sorry, I missed a bit. Um, and there needs to be a comprehensive transport assessment of the town. And we would like to work with the other tiers of council and LBA to see how this can be achieved. We're particularly concerned with the access along Little Keeper Lane. And in line with our response on the allocated Keeper sites, access should be from the B3092 Blatchbridge Road. There should be adequate employment provision such that all residents can potentially work on site, i.e. not increasing out commuting. But we also support Selwood Parish Council in their view that the land on the west side of the A361 or anywhere outside of the Froome Bypass should not be developed as this will eventually lead to development creep. Zoning should be less rigid. There should be more mixing of, up of activities and house types as in the older parts of Froome. And lastly, the proposed development has the potential to set a new standard in build quality and all buildings should be built to the highest environmental standards. So that's a very short summary of the report um, and the recommendation, which I think is on the next slide, is that councillors agree 
following discussion for response set out in the report. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Sorry, Rich, and then Mark. Hi, right, Jane, could you just cl clarify, you said that those are the minimum numbers of housings from Mendip. So for example, Saxon Vale says 250, but currently the plans being put forward are for 300, I believe. Yeah, so, so where an, a site is allocated, um, it will always say must provide a minimum amount of houses. So that means if they, as in Saxon Vale, uh, where they have applied for a higher number, that that's that's okay um, because they have provided the minimum. What what they're trying to avoid in that case is that the land is not used effectively and a lesser amount of houses is built than is needed. Um, but it also does give scope for more houses to be built, um, and it also enables um, Mendip to get a higher number of houses towards the requirement they need for the local plan period. Thank you. So the, the 2,882 figure could in fact turn out to be quite a bit higher than that. It could, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rich. Mark, you had a question? That's been answered just now, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, well, I'm sure, as I said, you probably have questions for Jane, but before we go to that section, um, Chris Bennett from Selwood Parish, would you like to give us your presentation this evening please. Yes good evening everybody and thank you very much for allowing us to attend and participate. Um, I'm the vice chairman of uh, Selwood Parish, Jim Dowling is the chairman and as a, he's unable to attend this evening so he's asked me to make this presentation. Uh, it's not really a presentation it's more of a, a statement really um, and it's been put together as a result of our committee meetings, our council meetings, and the views of uh, our, our constituents. So I'll begin by saying that, um, thank you for inviting us, to the, giving us the opportunity to participate in this meeting. I'm here to represent the views of Selwood Parish Council and our residents. And for those who may not know this, the suggested development falls very largely in the parish of Selwood. So our interests are very up close and personal. Let me start by saying that at this stage, we are not fully committed in either direction on the merits or otherwise of this proposal. However, we do have some very real concerns and requirements. We are also fairly sure that should this proposal go forward for outline planning, it will get the nod from Mendip District Council because it solves a lot of their immediate problems. We are therefore of the opinion that we should go forward as a group as a community, and by that I mean Froome Town Council, Selwood Parish Council, the Stop SC, SGC group, and the civil society and any other local interested parties who would like to come on board. We should have a common aim, which is to ensure the best outcome for the benefits of all concerned. Now, we are aware that there are potentially advantages that come from this development, but equally, there are dangers and negative outcomes that we must prevent at all costs. One thing we must guard against is the piecemeal development of this area, which will surely happen if we allow this group to become fragmented and, and incoherent. Failure to remain a coordinated group could end up with a hodgepodge of inappropriate and an, and an inappropriate estate with no community amenities, a dangerous road system, and an ecological disaster. We understand that quite a few of the residents have signed up to provisional sale agreements. And as I said earlier, this could well ease the pressure on Mendip District Council and help them solve some of their overnight problems and by providing more homes and more employment, et cetera, et cetera. Our concerns are best described by the lack of evidence, even trust for the perceived need set out by the local and central government. We are concerned that once the LVA group hand things over to the developers, there could well be insufficient checks and balances that guarantee the outcome, which is equal to the original plan. We must, take, must, must maintain a high level of vigilance and accountability and ensure that we get what we want and need. <clears throat> we must also remember 
that should this go to appeal or to the minister, the minister will probably favour the developers. So unity throughout this process is essential for this group if we can establish some common ground. In conclusion, I can tell you that we have gathered opinion from local people and we have fed this into the meeting under a separate note, which I hope the councillors will take into account when considering the forward pathway. May I also ask, uh, add uh, that our constituents are fairly negative about this development and as the parish, as the parish council, we will need to reflect their views unless changes are made to reflect their requirements. I have actually given some, uh, well, quite all the feedback we've had so far from our residents and hope you will be able to consider that during your discussions. But thank you once again uh, for Frim Town Council for taking the initiative on this. And can I make one last appeal to everyone to work together for the benefit of Froome and its surrounding villages. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. Okay, so uh, we are gonna go now to questions and comments from the public. Um, and as I've said, if you could pose your questions through the Q&A board, that would be really useful. And uh, Rachel will then let me know who's actually talking to us. So Rachel, do we have anyone so far? Yes, we do. The first question's from Rebecca Mao. Okay, Rebecca, what's your question, please? <coughs> Hi. Uh, yeah. Sorry. I'm, I'm, um, I'm Rebecca's partner, Matt. She's just dealing with little, little man upstairs. Um, so we wanted to know about um, how, how does this all fly in the face of, of the climate emergency that was declared last year? Um, 1700 houses is a huge amount of concrete, which is one of the heaviest carbon emitting um, processes going at the moment, not to mention roads. Um, there's no sort of facility in there to, to sort of um, aim to minimise car usage. There's no um, anything like that, not to mention digging up an awful lot of the Greenfield site, which is um, good. You know, grass is, is just as good at capturing carbon um, as many other things. So uh, in the face of that, really, um, none of the houses have been particularly tagged with um, any sort of passive kind of status none of it has been touted as um you know forward thinking you know even stuff like hempcrete or anything like that um, none of the houses seem to have solar paneling on the roof as standard there's no talk about ground source heat pumps rainwater collection all of these kind of things that are old old technology now that it, it and it, it just it, it doesn't seem that any of that you you shouldn't be allowed to build a house today if it doesn't, if it doesn't come as a carbon, completely carbon neutral, we, we cannot, and um, that, I'm not sure if I'm really asking the question. Uh, I'd, I'd like to see your insight in, into that, please, because based on the climate emergency that we've got going on right now, um, methane's being released at unprecedented rates up in the Arctic Circle. We're in trouble and this doesn't help. I'm not against housing. I'm not saying that, but it has to be epic now it has to be completely epic okay thank you for your question your query um jane would you like to take that thank you um it, it's a very good question um and i know within their consultation information they uh talked about some of the um things that they were going to do in uh regarding sustainability um I don't really know how to answer your question, if I'm honest. Uh, I think what we would need to do is once the application is formally submitted uh, to, to Mendip District Council, it will have to be accompanied by um, a very comprehensive statement setting out, or hopefully answering all of the questions that you've just asked. Um, and, and as I said before, one of the things that we feel we need to do is to be able to see all of that information um, uh, and actually, you know, we take advice from, from people who know far more about building sustainability and so on that, than certainly myself. Um, so I'm not sure that that really answers your question, but rest assured it is something that we will take a very close look at once 
that detailed information is published as part of the application. Okay, thank you. Does that answer your question for the moment? Uh, yeah, for the moment, that's, um, yeah, if you haven't got the information, you know, you haven't got the information, so that's that's great, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rachel, any more questions? Um, yes, so staying on the same theme, Steve Ehrlicher has asked, why, clover, uh, why cover fields with solar panels when so many roofs are going to be available? Each property should be able to be designed with a suitable element of south-southwest facing roofs. Thank you. Um, I'd like to take that one. Okay. Yeah. Um, again, we we would want to see the, the detailed information once it's submitted. Um, I believe the question was a similar question was asked um, in the first meeting we had, and the response was that there will be solar panels and other sustainability methods on the houses themselves, and that the solar farm will be in addition to that. Um, but, but again, I don't really feel that we've got enough information to, to fully answer that question at this stage. Okay, does that help, Steve? I wonder. Right, um, any more, Rachel? Um, yes, Philippa Clark would like to ask a question. Sorry? Philippa Clark would like Philippa to ask Clark. Philippa, yeah. We have Philip online. Thank you. Philippa, are you happy to pose your question? Sorry, she says the microphone's not working. Um, Philippa, would you be able to type your question? She's. I did. She has typed her question. It's very short. Yeah. Someone could read it. She simply asks, are there no brownfield sites in Mendip? Yes, um, th there are brownfield sites in Mendip. Um, I must admit, I am not familiar with the amount of housing that could be accommodated on brownfield sites throughout the district. Um, but that's certainly a question I can ask of Mendip although I'm sure it, it won't be enough to accommodate an additional 600 houses a year across the district. And also it is reliant on the people who own those brownfield sites coming forward and making applications on them to provide that additional housing. Um, so yes, there are other sites. Um, I don't know whether there, there are enough to provide that requirement. Okay, Philippa. Uh, thank you, Jane. Uh, Rachel. Uh, John Clark would like to make a statement. Okay, thank you. Good evening, John. Uh, good evening. Uh, I appreciate I've made comments on previous occasions, so I'll keep this brief as possible. Um, so I just wanted to raise a number of points and ask a question of councillors rather than Jane. And thank you, Jane, for the paper. It's very informative. Um, first off, um, in, in the paper, you talk about the uh, looking at the uh, benefits against the um, benefits which are not sufficient. Um, I would like to propose actually there needs to be consideration around the pack, what is considered to be the planning balance, which is looking at significant harm versus potential benefits. Um, and I believe there will be significant harm uh, in many respects uh, if this site was to be developed, um, not least the loss of biodiversity and environmental damage and also the, the carbon impact. Um, I appreciate what you say, that there's no evidence that Froome needs any new housing. There's only need, as I understand it, for 1,600 a year. Um, however, as you rightly say in the paper, Mendip are, because of lack of land supply or unable to identify land supply in the future plan, which is coming forward, uh, we will see predatory developers will use this lack of land supply and put in applications, which I believe will not always be in the interest of FOOM, but the interest of making maximum profits. Um, uh, what I'd like to ask FOOM Town Council is that would they consider a review of the neighbourhood plan um, to reflect the current and future needs of Froome. Uh, 
This should in part be based around engaging with all sections of the community and would they undertake a survey which would provide evidence base for any future developments because although developments are coming forward and they have come forward, uh, FUN, uh, as I am aware of, has no real evidence base as to what FUN needs now in terms of what residents may tell us uh, what they wish is for the future. Um, and I, I also believe there is still time if this application were to come forward, um, perhaps like Saxon Bell, I've been told um, it may not be uh, um, considered uh, during the statutory period of 12 weeks, but may take anything from three to six months, although there's a risk to that. So in terms of timescales, we do have time to undertake such a survey. And I think this would be for FUM's sake and not for developers' sake. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I think really rather than involve lots of councillors responding, which would take up some of this time for the public, uh, I wonder, Anna's leader, I wonder if you could express a view for us. Well, we, I know we've had calls for an update of our neighbourhood plan in the past. Um, we, we have got a neighbourhood plan. Am I, am I right, Paul? Um, Paul Wynn, if I, it, when, when did we create our, our neighbourhood plan? 2016. So it's, it's relatively recent. Um, my understanding is creating a neighbourhood plan takes a lot of resources and costs a lot of money. Um, so it's, it's a question of the cost of that, um, as opposed to the benefits that we would see from such a neighborhood plan and, and how, how much we could use it to counter, um, calls for development like, like this. Um, so I know we've had calls for, a, a, an update of our neighborhood plan in the past. I wasn't a counselor in, um, 2016. So um, I'm going to defer to Jane now. Um, maybe you could talk talk all of us councillors through the process of creating a neighbourhood plan, the sort of work involved and the cost involved in updating the neighbourhood plan. Sorry, Councillor Hills, can I just come back on that point? I'm not asking for a new neighbourhood plan. I'm just asking for a review of the neighbourhood plan in terms of looking at the needs of the FOOM needs now to inform any developers so we get developments which actually are meeting the needs of FOOM rather than developers coming this and saying, this is what we're going to build. I, I'm sure Jane will be able to give us some insight into that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll try. Um, so, uh, you know, I have been, uh, I have been talking recently about, you know, perhaps now is the time to, to look at reviewing our neighbourhood plan. Um, the, 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 in response to, to John's question, um, there, there are two issues that there is quite a formal process that we have to go through in order to carry out that review. Um, and unfortunately, that will take quite a long time, possibly longer than it will for, for the application to be determined. The second issue that has cropped up recently um, is that I'm, I'm sure most of you will be aware that the, a white paper has been published talking about new planning reform. Um, and because the proposed reforms are talking about local plans not containing policies and the fact that our neighbourhood plan had to sit beneath the policies in the local plan uh, and I couldn't be at odds with them, it's going to be, we're, we're, I've actually asked this question um, at a local, uh, a recent forum um, and we couldn't get any clarity from um, the Department of Local Government as to actually how neighbourhood plans will be treated going forward should the, um, <coughs> the white paper go through. So I actually don't know how we would be able to look at updating our neighbourhood plan at this point in time. And I know that's probably not the answer you were looking for, um, but I, I don't know how we're going to do it going forward and what the impacts of Mendip's uh, revision of part one of their local plan will be either. Um, but it's it's something that I'm working on getting an answer to the question, um, as are other councils in the same situation as us. Thank, Thank you, Jane. Jane. The, the second part of the question was about whether the Foom Town Council could initiate a comprehensive survey, survey engaging with the community. 
A continuity, so are you saying, John? No, engaging with the community oh, around okay. what the community feels they would need and what their intentions might be in the future in terms of where they would like to live. You know, for example, would they live within, would they like to live in a rural setting or a semi-rural setting? Would they like to live in a development such as a Selwood Garden Village? Thank you. Steve? Oh, sorry, Selwood Garden Community. Yeah. Because it's um, if I could just, um, thanks, um, uh, uh, Madam Mayor, if I could just jump in on um, on um, Councillor Clark's point about a housing needs survey. Um, there is a, a hopefully um, a comprehensive housing survey going to be um, conducted in that part of this year, early next year, as a partnership between Fair Housing for Froom, um, Community Land Trust, Froom Town Council and Mendip District Council, which will um, hopefully uh, highlight the, the, the comprehensive housing needs of the people of Froom. We have, we have it partly funded at the moment and we're just trying to raise the balance. And um, it's, this will be done by an external company and um, be very much accredited with Mendip District Council um, once, once we get it off the ground. Okay, thank you, Steve. That answers your questions, John? Yes, thank you very much. And no doubt Foom Town Council would want to contribute to that financially as well. Thank you. Or are, are they? So I missed that bit. Yes. <laughs> so any more, thank you very much, John. Any more questions, Rachel? Yes, we've got a question next from Andrew Carpenter. Okay. Andrew. Evening. Hello. Hi. Good all. Am I loud and clear? Yes, you are. Jolly good. Uh, I realise I had my opportunity to speak last week, uh, but there are two points that I think are very important. The first is that we have a very different society post COVID 19. I work in the uh, UK construction industry by day and I attend weekly meetings, particularly on housing. Um, and we've noticed a huge change in society in terms of the way they want to live their lives and the way they want to work. And my first request is that the uh, post-COVID-19 society is taken into account, maybe with a revision at the way we look at the design. There's certainly been a move to people wanting gardens, and there's certainly been a way, uh, move towards people wanting not to, uh, to work in city centres like Bristol, Birmingham, London, but to have what we might call regional hubs. And I think some sort of regional working hub, if this goes ahead, would be worth considering. It's certainly something I'm talking to Birmingham Council about, Gloucester LEP, Worcester LEP, Cornwall Dorset LEP and others. So um, I'll put that one in the mix. The second <laughs> thing is I have brought up in the last two weeks about designing to passive house standards. And this is the very best in uh, sustainability standards for design. Now we do have difficulty, it has to be said, in the UK reaching passive house standards. However, we can get close. And I personally don't favour things like solar panels and so on, on um, housing. We consider that in the industry as bling. Um, we would much prefer what's called a fabric first approach, where you take the sustainability into account in the design. Now, I, I have to express an interest because I'm chief executive of the Structural Timber Association. So I head up the UK timber frame sector and uh, timber frame is now the building material of choice for all sorts of reasons. One, because of things like energy efficiency and two, because of embodied carbon. So. But my request is to move down the passive house or as close as you can to design and uh, take into account building products like timber. So France, for example, uh, by 2022, Macron has said that all government uh, buildings must have at least 50% timber. So they're moving away from the use of concrete and steel wherever possible. And I would suggest if we want to take a lead, we could and should do that. There is a massive housing crisis we're meant to be building 300,000 homes a year. I was in a conference this morning. I can tell you that this year we're going to build 75,000 private dwellings and about 21,000 uh, affordable houses. We're way down on what we need. So the need is even greater. 
and we need to play our part. This is a fantastic opportunity. We should be so thankful that people want to invest in Froome. Developers want to invest. And this will act as a catalyst for more investment, more jobs, more opportunities. Bring it on, Froome Town Council. Thank you and good night. Thank you, Andrew. Our next question is from David Bales. Thank you. Good evening, David. Evening. Uh, thanks very much for giving me the, the chance to comment. Um, I think my, my uh, question is going to be quite a familiar one. Um, it's, it's mainly spurred in the face of a lot of development that's going on on the outskirts of Froome, uh, this one being by far the largest. Uh, and it's really about whether there's going to be an end to it, whether the council sees there ever being a maximum size to Froome that the, the centre can bear and the road network can bear, or whether this is just going to be the latest development and after it's approved, then we'll move on to the next one and we'll continue the, the bolt-on extensions to, uh, to the edges of the town. Thanks for your question, David. Jane, would you like to come back on that? Thank you. Um, again, it is another good question. I, um, Mendip, as the planning authority, set out the figures for new houses in their local plan, uh, which is normally covers a period of up to 20 years in the future. Um, and we've, as you've seen, we've just looked at those figures. Um, and if you if you look back at old maps of Froome, yes, you're absolutely right. You, you will see over a period of time how it has continued to have grown. Um, I would I would hope that if a development of this size, wherever it may be, was to go through, that would actually help towards further large extensions happening and, until the next round of the local plan allocations, by which time Mendip would be in a position to say, how many more houses we would have to take. Um, but I, I, I guess I would ask councillors' views on that as well. You know, do they think there is a maximum size for Froome? I, I, I think it's true that um, most places will continue to grow over time. Um, um, and where is that limit? I, I would, I would view, value councillors' views on that as well. Mm. Good question, Jane. Well, I, I will certainly put a view forward, first of all, before anyone else does, if that's OK. Um, just to say that I feel there probably would need to be a limit at some point. I think Froome uh, is quite extraordinary in that it's almost built down in the valley for the main part of the town. Um, I think it's fine to contemplate larger developments as long as they have the infrastructure along with them to support them. Um, but I would be loath to see the atmosphere of a market town, a medium-sized market town like ours, become so big that we suddenly start to become anonymous. I think one of the attractive things about Froome is that we have a population that is close enough at this stage, albeit with one or two lumped on the sections, as we're seeing. Um, but I, for one, wouldn't want to see it get uh, absolutely huge. So that would be my view. Does anyone else have a view? Any other hands, councillors? John. Unmuted now. Uh, no, I'd echo everything you just said, Anita. But we do know, and I think we know from fair housing for from other, you know, there is a shortage of how good, the proper type of housing. In yes. Firm. So we, we, we shouldn't be thinking about stopping development. And actually it's out of our control. You know, as Froome, we don't have that control uh, over planning. You know, we, we, we are a consultative community. We don't have statutory control. So I welcome uh, Councillor Bennett's comment, um, uh, very much so. And I support that. And I think that this, I did this concept of uh, collaboration and vigilance and accountability and unity actually with, with our two councils, I think is really important. And I think that's plays into how we get control. We want to have control, we want to get control. And if the unitary changes are happening, if we could get more planning control, then we would actually have some say and power in these discussions. So, I, And I think all the parishes together working 
together. I think we will have that power if we negotiate properly. Thank you. Well said. Thank you, John. Uh, Rob, you had a point? Yeah, I, I, I mean, welcome John's comments and your, and your own, Anita's. But I mean, I do think there is an answer to that question. I, I don't propose to try and give it here because I don't have it. But I do think we need to address that. And that's presumably what the neighbourhood plan is all about. So reviewing that and coming to a firm conclusion as to what is the appropriate size seems to me to be very sensible. Otherwise, I think uh, the point which uh, our previous questioner was saying is is very apt. We'll just carry on having more and more bolt-ons, you know, because there'll be a lack of clarity as to at least our position in relation to that question. Thank you, Rob. Jane. Sorry, I should have pointed out when I was talking about the neighbourhood plan that actually it only covers the parish of Froome. Um, so we wouldn't able we wouldn't be able to include the, the land that's outside of the boundary, which is in fact in Selwood Parish. Um, that would actually require we wouldn't be able to amend our existing neighbourhood plan on that basis. Um, what, what we would need to do uh, is we would have to uh, work in collaboration, have an agreement with the Selwood Parish Council and actually produce a plan specifically for it, including that area. Um, so yes, absolutely, I, you know, I, I understand what Rob is saying, but it's just occurred to me that I never mentioned the fact that our neighbourhood plan only covers the parish of Froome. Thanks for that clarity, Jane. Maxine, did you have a question? Yeah, um, <clears throat> just to say, if we did a, a an updated housing needs survey, um, that would cover it, wouldn't it? Because it's the need for Froome, which would include areas just outside of Froome, I think, from memory. Thank you. Steve, can you confirm that? Uh, yes, that would be the, in, the intention, Maxine, would be to sort of look at I suppose greater room, for want of a better word. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm guessing that those areas would be included as well. Thank you. Okay, David, does that give you an, an answer of sorts? Uh, of sorts, yeah. I'm, I'm sure you'll appreciate it doesn't give me the uh, the concrete answer I would hope for, but um, I think a lot of the, the thoughtful sentiments are, are very helpful. And yeah, I would would encourage the council towards probably influencing, I guess, Mendip District Council in coming up to a, a firmer answer on that question. We do our best, David. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rachel, any more questions? Um, yes, we have a point of process first. Casper uh, Sell, and I think this is answered in response to the first question, has asked, how can the council give a position when it doesn't have enough information on the proposal? Why such haste? Okay. Thank you. Um, Jane, sorry, is that another one for you, do you think? Um, yes, I'm happy to answer that. Um, I, I, my view is that actually that is exactly right. That's that's why we're not giving a view necessarily at, at this point. Um, what we're looking at is a pre-application response to, to see how we can um, influence the application before it's submitted and it, as i've said it's not until the application is submitted we'll have all that information that we will actually be making that decision an informed decision about whether we are in favor of or against this application so that that's how i see it anyway thank you i hope that answers the question Okay, thank you. Um, any others, Rachel, please? Yes, we have another question now from uh, Pippa Hal. Okay. Pippa? You're muted, Pippa. Every time I ask her to unmute, it seems to bounce back. Oh, okay. Oh, it's gone. Okay. Pippa, can you hear us? I can hear you very well. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. I can now. Okay, yeah. great. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm just interested, going beyond the whole issue of whether this is the right place for this development and the issue of valuable land being covered 
with building. Um, I'm just wondering what is the council's position? Is there anybody on the council who is looking at the actual plan of the development in terms of sufficient food growing capability? Do the houses really have enough garden? Are there enough community allotments and orchards? What is your feeling about that? And is somebody keeping an eye on it? Given, given that we want more local food supply in, in the future, and at the moment, all the modern developments coming up have these ridiculous tiny backyards and half of them are on sites where, um, I mean, that's unfortunately the downside of brownfield sites is they're often not safe for growing your own veg. Mm. Okay, thank you for your question, Pippa. Rich, would you like to answer that? Uh, hi, Pippa. I just like to say, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of big gardens because um, I grew up with one and uh, it meant we could play football, we could do lots of hobbies, and we didn't have to go out on the street to do it. I'm, I'm always saddened when houses are built with no garden space. That's really, really sad to me. Even if you're a single person living in a flat, you deserve a bit of green space. So I, I understand from the plans so far that it's 50% green area, but that includes gardens. So I, I don't, we haven't got the details yet to say how big exactly each garden is gonna be. But I do have a concern that uh, the number of houses has gone up from 1,500 to 1,700, which tends to suggest the garden space would be less than it might have been. But you make a good point. Thanks very much for your question, Pippa. We've got two questions now, both from Trevor Mills. Okay. Evening, Trevor. Oh, good evening. Thanks for taking my call. Can you hear me okay? Yes, that's fine. Thanks. Um, yeah, there was just a couple of questions, really. The first one was that the site, along with the Sandy Hill development, has quite a few veteran and ancient trees. Myself and a few others have been recording these, and these are of various ages. Will Froome Town Council support a blanket tree protection in order to make sure these aren't felled and are protected in the future? Can you give me an answer on that? Oh, good question. Uh, who's the best person to answer that? Rich? Hi Trev, hope you're well. Uh, I'd personally support that if we can, yes. Uh, one of the good things about this uh, Selwood Garden Community Plan is that they tend to keep most of the old hedgerows and existing trees. I'm not so sure about the Sandy Hills Lane development, but yeah, I would support that. Okay, thank you. I think you get a lot of support for that. All right. Yeah, that would be great if, if you could, because they obviously hold so much biodiversity themselves and you just can't replace them that quickly, can you, when they're 200, 300 years old? Um, is, that information, is that information readily available to everyone? Are you sharing that? Is that a question to me? Well, it's, yeah, it's a question to you, because I, I, agree, with, I agree with the point. I totally yeah, agree. Yeah, I mean, we've... we've you know, yeah, myself and a few others, including Julian Height, who's quite a knowledgeable chap on trees around this area, have been recording the trees and uh, Julian's in the process of sending that off now to Mendip Council. Um, there's, there, there is a, a large amount of, like I said, these trees that are so important to keep. Thank you, Joey. Um, can, I ask, can I ask one more question, just quickly? Sure. Oh, and Anne, this is... can I just take a, uh, we've sorry, got a yes. sorry, hand up. Sorry, Trevor, just one second. Anne, you want uh, to make a point? Well, I just wanted to um, hopefully assist Trevor in that. That may well be something, Chris Bennett, that we need to liaise with you on because these trees are outside of our parish. Um, so that might be something that we actually need to work with you on in getting um, TPOs in place. I fully agree with that, actually, because it's, it, it's a bit disconcerting when you have a group of people sending information to Mendip Council when they actually should be feeding into some sort of central area where we can coordinate all of those comments. And what we should be doing is encouraging people to join together and feed back into a central point where we can coordinate all of that stuff that then goes wherever it needs to go. So yes, I fully agree with that. Um, we have actually made the point that who's going to safeguard the welfare of the ancient trees within that particular within this particular site? 
Yes, so yes, Anna, we're fine. We're we're actually full, fully behind you on your comment, and we would love to support that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Anne. Um, uh, I'm Trevor, I know you've got another point, but I've got another couple of hands up if I can take those first. Jane. Thank you. Um, Trevor, did I understand that you were saying that you are actually going to be submitting an application for those trees to, to have a preservation order on them? We've, uh, yeah, Julian's actually um, collating a report now, which has various of the, yeah, it's got a good amount of information on the trees that you know we've been recording over the past few weeks so he's submitting that to um is it Bo Walsh yes, uh, yes. Yeah. officer yeah so uh yeah that that's going to be going off um okay. yes the, the, the only reason I ask is because to, um uh, uh, Chris Bennett is absolutely right we will get notified of um a tree preservation order being applied for mm -hmm. if it's within our parish um, but it may well be that the notification of the application goes to Selwood Parish Council. Mm. So um, wh whichever way it happens, we will make sure that we liaise. Thank you. Thank you. Peter, you had a point to make? Just to say that this is something that potentially we can bring to a council meeting for, for councillors to support. Mm, so that's something we should, we should think about in the, in the context of our planning. Thank you. Steve, can you make a note of that? <laughs> um, thank you very much. So, um, any other hands? Uh, Rachel? Um, uh, just a follow-up comment from Julian. He says the tree survey will be ready to share next week. Lovely, thank you very much. Um, I'm conscious that time is moving on and I do want to make sure that Clancy's got a chance to debate this. Uh, do we have many more questions in the, in the I've got section? I've got I've got two more questions. Two more. Well, I think we'll take those two and then call that a halt so that we can have a discussion as councillors at that stage then. So. OK, so uh, the next question is from Helen Kay. OK, thank you. Um, it, it wasn't it wasn't so much a question as as there isn't a chat function. So I was trying to. Um, reply to something, then I think I wrote it just at exactly the same time as Jane Llewellyn said that the neighbourhood plan is, with what she said, is what's written there, it's, it's, is only relevant for within the parish boundary of Froome. Oh. And the, the importance of working with Selwood Parish Council in looking forward to maybe do a survey of some sort you know i don't know if room town council and selwood parish council could work together on this but following up john's point really of some sort of survey and it could be something that we bolt onto the housing survey about how people see room developing to and i think it's good to have an end date like let try and get people to think forward 15 years say 2035 uh, what will room look like how will room function and um you know so that so that it's not being led by developers that it's actually being led by people's desires uh, that live in Froome right now. Um, so it was it was just a suggestion as a way forward, really. Lovely, thank you very much, Helen. And finally, Rachel. Our next question is from Ian Bellamy. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Ian. Hear us? Uh -huh. You can now. Yeah. Good evening, Ian. Hi, this is Ali Bellamy. Hello. Um, uh, speaking for Ian and Ali. Um, we're worried about representation and how can the Froome and Selwood Parish community input into this plan, which will affect us all during a pandemic when many people have health and real financial concerns and Zoom is not possible for many of our community. Can you feed back on that for me, please? Good question, thank you. Who'd like to take that one? Paul, thank you. I think it's really important that, that, that we do try hard to get representation during this time. 
what we've been trying to do is put stuff into the local press and on notice boards as well as using social media. Um, and, and I think Jane's had quite a few responses uh, to, to the request um, via that, that was uh, appeared in, in, in the local press. So I think that we're never going to get it as good as we would like uh, in the current situation. But I think by using the local press and notice boards in particular, we, we, we managed to get a bit more coverage and give more people an opportunity. But it's absolutely right. It's, it's not ideal. Sorry, Ali, does that help? Uh, yeah, I just am very worried that it's, uh, it, in effect, a dangerous time for things to slip under the wire when people are not focusing on longer term proposals that will really affect their community and their town. Um, it, people that live even on the other side of town that are nowhere near uh, the development area will be affected. And I'm really concerned that many people in our community, they really are not online, they do not engage with social media, and they will not have a voice. Thank you. Good point. Peter, you have something to say? Well, I just noticed that Rachel had her hand up, and I don't know whether she wanted to add to um, the, the comments that Paul was making about communicating with the community. Thank you. Rachel? Well, I just wanted to add that we wrote, worked really hard to uh, make sure that people who are digitally uh, excluded, if you like, um, are uh, able to be represented, particularly using our local press and, as Paul said, our notice boards. So, okay. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, Paul? Thanks, uh, Annie. So I, I just wanted to clarify really that um, in regards to the question that um, I think if it was down to us, I think I can speak for everyone, um, we would love to just put this off until after these COVID complications. Um, we'd like to have proper uh, meetings in the town hall, et cetera, et cetera, discuss this. Um, it's really the promoters that are driving the timetable and we have to respond in the only way we can at the moment, which is unfortunate. Absolutely. Thank you. Chris, you had a point? Could I just clarify the question, was she, uh, is she a resident within the Selwood Parish Council? Could she use the term from, from Selwood Council? Could, could she clarify that? Because if she wants, I mean, there is a website, we do have a website, and we do publish our regular meetings. So if she wants to communicate with any of us, because all of our details are on the website, if they have concerns about, you know, the, any of these questions, just feed them into us. And if we can create this group of people, group of organisations, we, we are a natural conduit into that sort of group. So, you know, I'd, I'd really encourage her to look on the website and sort of contact any of the councillors and give us give us their give us her views so that we can feed back to the group. Is that okay? That's lovely. Thank you very much. I think Alison um, lives in Lower Keyford, so uh, that would be part of Froome rather than Selwood. So, okay. It's up to her. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's whatever she wants to do. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, I just wanted to let you know that Trevor Mills had two parts of his question. The second part he didn't read. Shall I, if you are happy for me to just read that out? It has been. Yeah, thank you. Um, so it says the proposal only mentions one school, primary, no secondary and no middle. There is no other medical centre. A small amount will be affordable. The majority won't be affordable for local people. This will put significant pressure on the infrastructure of a town already under strain. The middle sec slash secondary school will not be able to sustain the increase, nor will the medical practices. How can this level of development be justified when there is little extra resources such as the above being put into place? Thank you, Rachel. Okay, would anyone like to comment on that? Jane. Thank you. Uh, yes, I mean, we're, we're, we share those concerns, uh, which is one of the reasons why um, in in the report and actually part of the response we have we have said that going forward um, we would want to have discussions with the medical center the schools um, youth and young people lots of organizations because the 
what we heard at the first meeting when LVA did their presentation was the reasoning behind the, the school that they're proposing uh, was based on the figures and feedback that they'd had from Somerset County Council who are responsible um, for, for education. Um, and in fact, that the uh, medical practice or the NHS um, actually didn't want to provide any separate facilities in that part of the development. Um, uh, and we heard that, um, but at the same time, we, you know, we really understand that that is a big concern for people. So we feel that part of what we would do going forward um, is have those discussions ourselves with those key stakeholders to try and understand that a bit more um, and, and perhaps express direct, directly to them the concerns that we are hearing from uh, residents. Thank you, Jane. Okay, well, I, I hope uh, all the participants feel or the attendees feel that we've covered a lot of their questions this evening. I think certainly we're armed with an awful lot of information now about how people feel about this. We've heard an awful lot of questions, um, a, a lot of which can be added to the list that we already have. Um, so I think that was really interesting to hear from you all, and thank you very much for that. I think now what I'd like to do is to move on to a discussion between councillors. We're actually here tonight to make a decision, um, and that is a decision in response to the pre-application consultation um, on Selwood Garden Community and we're being asked, the recommendation is whether we should agree the above, uh, which is Jane's report, as a formal response to the pre-application consultation. Now, uh, as councillors, we will have all read this report. Um, before I actually ask for a vote, can we, is there anyone that has any questions for Jane or any comments you'd like to raise at this stage? Rob. Yes, um, I mean, thank you for the your report, Jane, and um, I mean, I can understand that it's it's a, a really tricky job trying to arrive at a, a statement that covers a wide range of issues without ending up writing a book almost. But um, my main concern is that, that uh, and you already say this in your report, that, uh, that there needs to be a comprehensive review of the transport needs of the town and it seems to me completely stupid to go ahead with a plan of this sort um, without understanding what 1,700 new homes and all the cars associated with that will have for the rest of the town. And I don't see how any of us can actually have much idea of what that would mean until uh, there is you know, some really serious thinking based on professional expertise that... Uh, goes into, in, into assessing that. And um, I'm fully aware that we, in the end, we, we can only express an opinion. We don't actually have any power over deciding what happens, but in terms of expressing our views as to what's going to happen to us, it just seems to me utterly ridiculous to proceed with um, giving any kind of positive, uh, I suppose, assent to this process Without, without some much more comprehensive uh, information and, and, and principally in relation to the, the impact of transport that this kind of development is going to have. So I suppose I would like just your report to have much more emphasis on, on that um, than it already has. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. John, you, oh, and Scott in that order? John then Scott? Oh, you don't want you don't have a question, John. No, 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 I'm just leaning against the wall. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, um, right, Scott, the floor is yours. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, first of all sort of um, double up on what Rob has mentioned there about traffic. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm part of a, an ongoing discussion about traffic uh, coming into the town, uh, up the ski slope and into the butts. Um, and I don't think until those issues and other infrastructure issues within Froome are resolved, that um, adding to those issues and to those problems is, is a smart idea. So just to sort of double up on what Rob said there. Um, the second thing is I, I, I live up on Culver Hill in the Mount area. And uh, I quite often mentioned that we don't have resources up at this end of town. Um, you know, everyone has to travel quite a distance to 
the dentist or to see a doctor or to get into town. Um, it, it's kind of, you know, the out of the way part. Um, and so the promise of things like a school and um, businesses and green spaces and parks is fantastic. It, it sounds great. I don't think we need 1700 houses that go with it. Uh, and also my, my biggest concern is that ultimately once, um, you know, LVA take this forward and get an outline planning and they start selling off the land to different developers to come and build in, there's no guarantee that that will actually ever happen. It's, it's complete fantasy at this point. I mean, I, I could draw a map with a thousand different things on a water slide, a helter skelter and say, that's what I'm going to build. Why not, you know, let me sell the land and, and get lots of money. It's, it's just, there's, there's no <laughs> substance to it really at this point. It's pure fantasy. And I don't think that's something that I can support. And it's definitely not something, um, that people uh, in, in the Keyford area and in the High Point Ward can can um, support either. And I'm saying that through the, the multiple emails and messages and Facebook messages that I've received over the past week or so. So that, that's my bit. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, I, I need to echo that. I live just a little bit further out, out on the outskirts of Froome from, um, from Scott, um, many, many, emails um, and contacts with with people over the past few days um, I think I think my biggest concern is if if this goes ahead and then it gets developed in a piecemeal fashion anyway what what guarantee if at all do we have that the rose tinted view that we've been presented, with by LVA ever comes to fruition in anything close to that form? How, how can we ensure that even if, if we were in agreement with these plans, that's what actually gets developed? Can we have any, Jane? Is, is there any way we can hold their feet to the fire? Um. That's a good question as well. Uh, so one of the things that they have stated in the uh, consultation uh, is that they will, as part of an outline application, that submit a series of design codes, which would set out specific parcels and um, it would indicate the kind of materials that, that the house layouts perhaps you know when we were talking about gardens and so on before um, properties will be no higher than they will be built to a certain sustainability standard which, which is great um, and we don't normally see design codes submitted with outline applications so um, they could or hopefully would stop what we tend to see happening happen when reserve matters applications are submitted. But actually, you know, that would be dependent upon the, the district council um, tying up those design codes sufficiently so that they, they can be enforced and that when reserve matters applications come forward, in, in, ensure that they are actually in line uh, with what we've shown on the outline plans. Um, so, so I can't give you any guarantees in that respect. I can just tell you what they're proposing. Um, and, and a follow-up to that, if, if you don't mind. Um, if, if we were to object in the strongest terms to these plans and they get passed anyway, ha, ha, where, where do we stand? Where do we stand? I mean, that, that's really one of the reasons why I think it's important at this pre-application stage that we, if it is approved by the District Council, which, you know, you're quite right, and other people have said it could be, we want to make sure that we, we're starting from a good starting point. We, we know from experience that just because we object to applications doesn't mean they always get refused. Um, and... That's why just you know, need to try and make it as good as we can now, should that happen. I appreciate that that 
won't be something that everybody wants to hear and they may not feel that that's the right way forward but um that's what i've tried to set out in my report which hopefully comes through thank you okay thank you uh i think we've got paul horton and then andrew palmer and then rich yeah thanks um multiple things to to um to comment on i think really so um I think, I mean, I, 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 I agree. Firstly, maybe I, I agree with uh, Scott and, and Anne's concerns that um, uh, with all the lovely drawings and, and words and everything, that actually it won't necessarily be like that. You know, we, we need really kind of strong ways of making sure that um, development goes ahead as, as envisaged. Um, and then I would add to that and say, the vision at the moment isn't good enough. And I think we need to be really clear in that response that this, this the vision needs to be far, far better than it is. Um, we're looking at, you know, we, we're talking about money. Money's driving this at the moment. Uh, the promoters, the landowners, etc., are potentially going to make millions from this if this goes ahead. Um, and we want, we want that at least some of that money to be spent for the for the benefit of the town, um, and only then will we will we consider supporting it in any sense. Um, and just going to the uh, looking at uh, transport because that's been mentioned. Um, I think uh, everyone everyone has, who's talked about transport was very concerned about the impact of extra cars um, on the roads of Froome, and I totally agree with that. I mean that is a, a huge concern. However. Um, that, that concern is not just driven by developments like this, it's driven by our culture um, of, the, of the country. And we need to start changing that culture. The, that culture, the car culture is extremely damaging for everybody. Um, and a development like this maybe is, a bit, is a, an opportunity to actually challenge that culture and say, how can we make a development of 1700, 1500, whatever, which doesn't increase traffic to those levels. Is it possible? You know, can we do that? Can we demand from the from the architects, the, the promoters, etc., that that's what we want? We don't want a, a development of that's going to increase traffic in Froome. If they're going to develop, we want a development which doesn't increase traffic in Froome and actually encourages alternative way of living and way of moving around. So I believe it is possible, and in the sense, this is an opportunity to do that. But I think we have to be very demanding. Um, uh, and I mean, I think that's it. That's all I've got to say. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, Andy, you had a point. Thanks, Anita. Um, I've got a lot of notes, so please bear with me. Um, the first thing I just wanted to sort of put on record about brownfield development. I have a serious issue with brownfield um, in the sense that it's, it's literally backfield development. It means developing spaces within the town um, that would usually be filled by things like employment land and it could be empty but my biggest issue with backfill and brownfield is that it means that there's no infrastructure development around it so it creates an increase on the stresses of the current uh, infrastructure that we have so when you put in housing estates of, of, of 100 houses or 200, whatever we've seen with Caxton Road and, and potentially with Saxon Bell, it adds nothing in terms of infrastructure for the town. In terms of overall development, I think we're all agreed and I think everybody is aware that Froome needs to take its share of uh, new houses on uh, across, uh, as you would have across, across Mendip. And I think something like Selwood Garden Community is potentially a good way forward. But I put a caveat and a serious caveat on that by saying that I would like to see more guarantees over infrastructure and I would like to see cast iron agreements within Section uh, 106 agreements over things like medical facilities, schools, and not just primary schools, because I think as a, as a parent with primary children, I think we're fairly well served at the moment, and I think we've got capacity for more. My biggest issue is middle school squeeze and where we're going to be when Selwood and Oakfield are going to be full in a few years' time. So that's something that I think really needs to be looked at, and I think Section 106 is the way forward on that. 
in terms of this plan, is this the way forward? I don't know. I'd like to see this plan present maybe 850 homes, not 1,700. So we have to be clear that we need the houses and we have to give our share of houses, but I'm not convinced we need as many. And I would like to see proper debate with other, other colleagues about whether we need this many houses, uh, all three tiers of, of, of local government. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Uh, anyone else for a comment? John, John, has a, John. John has his hand up. John and then Andy. Um, yeah, no, it's just to echo what, what people are saying. So I'm thinking just strategically as a council, what we do. Uh, on the one hand, I'm totally supportive of our very measured feedback on the development. And I think what James done is excellent. So, you know, I think that, but at the same time, what I'm hearing is a lot of people have deep concerns from all ends of our political spectrum. And so my instinct is on the one hand, I'd like to support the thing we're asking, being asked to vote on tonight um, that, that James put together, because I think it's a good response. But on the other hand, I would not want that to be unanimous. And actually, I sort of feel like throwing it out and saying something else. So we don't have the choice to say something else here. So I sort of feel like <laughs> we should support it, but not unanimously, but actually register our hard concerns. I think we need to, we need to keep a hand in the game. Let's remember that we don't have that much power in this discussion. So I'm just wondering how we can leverage that best. That's, that, those are my thoughts, because I feel that generally speaking, people have deep concerns. Thanks, John. Andy, Rintmore. Yeah, uh, hi, thanks. Um, I, I feel that uh, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't stand in the way of progress. And as Andy Palmer said, uh, we do need to pick up our um, end of the bargain or the deal with housing. And I, I will echo a lot of, of what Andy Palmer said. The infrastructure thing is it's a serious thing. It's a real thing. Um, and uh, I feel that what Andy said in terms of wanting um, cast iron guarantees with those things is very, very sensible. But I'd also like to echo what um, what Scott said. Um, and we, we, we really need to be listening uh, to the people in, in the Mount area and really making sure that they they know that we we are listening and we have their back because I feel like sometimes they get left out of the conversation with these things. I think it's really important this time around not to do that. Thanks, Andy. I have to say for my own part, I have a lot of concerns. I, I think um, the work you've done is huge on this, Jane, and I, and I think your response is, uh, is excellent. Um, but uh, like a lot of other councillors, I have a lot of concerns, uh, primarily I think about the traffic um, and about the infrastructure because that is something major. If we, uh, I know on the one hand, we need to start to influence at this stage in the very early beginning <coughs> to, um, to put forward our ideas about what we would like to see. So I think it's crucial that we get involved at the very early stages. I think that's the right thing to do because the, the alternative is that we don't have, we don't say anything, we allow it to happen and then when it goes through and the planning application is granted, uh, we've got no comeback uh, and we've had no opportunity to shape it or influence. So I think it's right that we get in at this stage. Um, but there are some huge issues here around, around traffic and everything else. So yes, I'd, it's a really difficult dilemma. I don't think this is clear cut at all. Um, I, I feel we need to get in early, which is why I would support this motion um but yes there are concerns peter you have a view i, I don't have a view it's really just to uh, assist you anita um I, what i'd be able to uh, advise you on is the the order in which the blue hands have gone up um oh, thank you. so i can i can run i can run through that order for you lovely thank you um, so I think in terms of the blue hands at the moment uh rich is at the head of the queue Okay, Rich, <laughs> you're the winner. <laughs> Thank you. Well, <laughs> I've got a lot to say, so I'll keep it short. Uh, what, five years on town council? Froome has suffered greatly from a lack of joined up thinking when it comes to planning. You know, I can think of only one or two development proposals of any size 
that I genuinely thought were any good and that they, it was always the least worst option. Most at best satisfactory, some most, you know, pretty awful, to be honest. They don't consider the rest of the town. There's never adequate infrastructure. So I go back to Cat Stevens. Where do the children play? You know, where indeed? How do we develop any hobbies or any social life if, if the space that we live in is not adequate? So um, I hear lots of complaints about new housing estates and problems with them. Um, and I think that's through, it's, it's the monetary thing. I understand that people have to make a profit, but you know, no public transport, no play areas. Um, uh, developers having to be reminded to, to do their obligations under section 106 agreements, you know, long after they should have already come up with the cash, they have to be chased and pestered uh, by councillors. Outline planning stage is routinely broken at reserve matters. Promises made are routinely broken. And it seems to me, viability assessments um, that are too difficult even for qualified accountants to understand, hide behind a, a, an ugly truth is that uh, developers mostly see the local councils as, as a bit of a patsy, or we'll, we'll say something, but we'll do this. And I think we have uh, an opportunity here to change that. So I, I, I think we want to move away from um, anybody got a field or two that we need to put some more houses together. Who's got some land? Oh, you've got some land. Let's build there. Great. 250 houses. Fantastic. I'm only exaggerating slightly because that's the way Mendit planning works at the moment, it seems to me. So having a 10 or 20 year plan is really important. And I think that's what MBV, who started this game, have been trying to do. So, um, but as people have said, what happens when it gets to the, uh, uh, the promoter and the developer? Does it get watered down? These are really important things. Yes. I don't, I'm, I'm going on a bit, but civic society, I, I don't, we should be debating this. We're doing the right thing. We've got, we should be informing ourselves and the public we're doing the right thing. I have, um, misgivings about it, but I have, uh, you know, I like the idea that we're looking 10, 20, 15, whatever years ahead. Do I like it? At the moment, not entirely. Um, for following reasons that people said, why the rush? Um, future proofing eventual plans against speculative develop developers. If, we could, if this came about and it was agreed to put that many houses, nobody else should be allowed to put any speculative developments in Froome. But I doubt that that would be the case. I think they would still try that. We need a master plan that covers not just this development, but all the other ones that are already either being given permission, like Sandy Seals Lane or the DWH things by Dandelion Close. They need to be part of this plan as well. I think increasing the quota from 1,500 to 1,700 houses is in my opinion a mistake. It just shows that actually they're trying to squeeze uh, as much profit as possible. Um, I, I won't go on, but uh, the, my main worries are the number of houses, the Little Keyford access, way too narrow, water attenuation ponds, ponds or wetlands or play areas, what are they? They need to be one or the other, not a kind of mystical multi-use. If it's wet and boggy, you can't play football on it. Um, Thank you very much. So really. I think I've said it all, but uh, as it stands, I couldn't vote for this. Okay. Thank you very um, much. I'm looking to you for the order of hands. The, ne the next one is, is Steve, followed by Lizzie. Thank you. Uh, I'm just conscious that we're coming up to half eight, folks. So if we can make all your points as brief as we possibly can, I don't want to cut you short, but we are going to start to run over soon. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think Rich has basically did page one of my comments, so I won't say any of that. Um, the only thing I was, I, I mean, we, I, I can take this offline with um, councillors, or it, it's, it's really a question of, uh, it's, it's to the Mendip councillors, really. Are they going to form a group of Mendip councillors that lobby Mendip planning? Because they basically are the guys that will decide this. And there's quite a number of, of Mendip councillors. We hear from the odd one here and there, but we never seem to get a, a, a real sort of cohesive sound from Mendip councillors about planning, you know. So I think I'll, I'll raise this with, with, with John and Helen and, and others, but I think it would be really good 
for for mendic through through mendic councillors to come out with a statement where there are as as many as possible joined up and how they're going to lobby um mendic district council planning board about this good thank That's you thank point. you steve thanks sorry this it um, just checking my bingo card of, of words that I was going to say, and, and I don't want to repeat ones that have already been said. Um, I'll pick two. Um, sustainable, as in environmentally sustainable. Um, Paul Horton's bigger point about visionary. The vision isn't there yet. I agree with him. And I think the vision around sustainability isn't there yet, as many of our, our um, attendees have said um, already. And the other word that I will use is something about governance or accountability. Um, and how can we come up with ways in which whatever happens at this land has accountability back to the community and the community has an active voice in governing what happens on that land. And I think that has to go deeper than different tiers of local government doing formal responses to planning consultations and actually be much more rooted in what what the community wants, what the community needs, and, and maybe exploring ideas like citizens' panels, citizens' assemblies, to kind of really engage people in the conversations about, okay, the, the, the vision, but then the implementation, and have that ongoing dialogue with the community over the 10, 20 years of, of, of development that may well come our way. Okay. I think that's all I'll say. That's great. Thank you, Lizzie. Um, Mark and then Sheila, is that the right order, Peter? Um, could I just come in at that point? Um, one of the things that we're not asking councillors to do tonight is to support the proposal. Um, you know, the, the, actually, what what we're asking them to do is is to support the response that, that Jane has prepared, um, but not specifically support the proposal. I, I think that's worth emphasizing at this at this point. But we can we can we can come back to that um, a little bit later. Um, so in terms of the order, um, we had uh, Mark and then Sheila. Okay, thank you, Mark. Yeah, there's um, a lot in this. Uh, the utopia of it all being self-contained, um, everything within the ski slope and the rest of the bypass is is very appealing. Um, we've heard from Jane that we have no way of committing them. To do this as it is. Uh, my particular concern is transport. I'm being lobbied a lot in the, um, the, the closing of the town centre exposed a lot of pinch points around the town which are only going to get worse when we build Saxon Vale, Sandy Hill Lane, houses um, up on the mount. We need a complete review of the transport within the town. Um, people from the proposed new development will still have to travel to the bus side of Froome for the hospital and secondary education. They're not going to travel around the bypass that will take people through the town along the butts we need a review of everything that's happening within transport within the town especially in lieu of new developments and i'd like to build on steve's comment about mendip district council we've not been well served on their planning committee for some time now um, see sandy hill lane um, and i would call on helen and john as a substitute member of the planning board to use their influence to try and um, influence decisions for the benefit of Froome um, and if there's any money available because John wants to spend money on reviews uh, from the Covid fund from government then please get it to us and so we can think about spending it on something like this. Thank you. Thank you Mark and Peter did you want to come in before she I, I think um, maybe Rachel had a specific point to make in response to what Mark has said. I noticed Rachel you had your hand up. Um, Thanks, Peter. Yes, I just wanted to say we got a uh, comment on the Q&A board in response to Steve's comments and now Mark's just to say that John Clark absolutely agrees. So I would say that they are looking to um, form a councillor pressure group. Wonderful. That's very good news. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Um, okay. Sheila. Thank you. Um, I, it's really helpful, Peter, for you to clarify that what we're doing here is um, are we agreeing with this particular report or do we want to actually, I mean, I think from the, the discussion that we've had tonight is a lot of us would like to make it a lot stronger and more um, clarity there. I, the point that I would like to make is, first of all, that 
I'm incredibly grateful to all the people who have got together and informed themselves and looked at these plans and come to meetings and contributed emails to us. It really does keep us connected with what people in Froome actually want. And so it was fantastic to get so much response um, and uh, responding to planning, applica planning applications themselves are incredibly opaque and tricky to understand mm -hmm. and know how to contribute without getting cross and angry and you know <laughs> upset about them um, but and I think it's uh, really excellent how many people have actually sat down and written to all of us about the sort of things that they feel are really important and want to get across and some of the more of that has come up tonight um, I've been really interested in the debate and I really think that we need from lots of the comments that have already been made to um, make a stronger um, response to this and make sure, I would like to make sure that we include in that, that we would keep, that the purpose is really to keep consulting with all the councils that are actually involved in this. So uh, somewhere in that feedback to make a specific statement that we would keep connected with Selwood Parish Council and Mendip at the very least. Thank, Thank you. you, Sheila. Sure. Listening to the comments that a, a number of councillors have made tonight, and, and of course some of those are in response to the comments received from the public, it's clear that possibly one of the things that we do need to do is to beef up our response, to build on the on the response that's, that Jane has prepared. And of course one approach to this would be uh, potentially to ask Jane to do that for you, for you tonight to ask Jane to beef it up. I suppose the question is is whether you you um, you trust us to uh, actually do that and to take account of all of the points that you've made. Um, otherwise, it might be difficult for us to um, get, you know go through with a fine tooth comb tonight uh, and uh, uh, and make detailed uh, uh, amendments, um, but. But it's just a suggestion and it's something that you might want to put to um, to the councillor body tonight and uh, you know and see if that proposal comes forward. Thank you, Peter. Good suggestion. Lizzie. On a kind of practical process and calendar thing, um, we do have, I'm going to look at Steve now to make sure I've got my diary right. I believe we've got a planning advisory committee meeting tomorrow evening. And I don't know, I'm probably going to break rules, Paul and Peter, um, about whether if the recommendation that came back was to beef up um, uh, the, the language and the, 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 the tone of, of and the response, if then council could delegate to planning advisory committee to <clears throat> vote on it on their behalf tomorrow. I don't know if that breaks rules. Peter, what's your thinking on well, that? Well, uh, the, the difficulty I think that we have there is, is that it's not currently on the agenda for the planning committee tomorrow night. And we, no we normally need to provide a sufficient amount of notification for councillors to consider that. Um, one other uh, uh, approach you could take, uh, and I think I suggested that earlier, is that you could delegate authority to Jane or indeed to me to uh, actually uh, take account of, of the various comments that have been taken tonight and to, and to beef up that response and submit it to LVA on your behalf. So that, that is one approach that we could take in this instance. I think Jane had a hand up though, and she might, she might I don't know whether she agrees with me or, or, or whether she's got another idea. Um, I, I agree with you, Peter. I, I just wanted to say that um, given other commitments I have in place tomorrow I think it'd be unlikely that I would be able to get that revised um, <laughs> tomorrow. Jane. stay up all night <laughs> oh, okay <laughs> okay thanks Jane uh, John you've got your hand up and then Maxine well I just say I, I really trust Jane and I think Jane's a listener so I, I you know it doesn't have does, not necessarily for tomorrow night obviously but I would I would support delegating authority to Jane to come up to adapt the response that's been done to strengthen it in line with what she's heard tonight. And I I'm pretty satisfied that she would be able to reflect what we've said tonight in this thing, which is basically a statement from us. It's not approving it, but it's a statement from us 
So I, that, I would support mm -hmm. that. Thank you. Uh, Maxine and then Andy. Thank Not you. Back. I would also support um, us uh, letting Jane beef it up for us because I also trust Jane. Um, I, I know what amazing work she does. I, I want to give her the time to do it because obviously we, we want quality, not speed. So, you know, let's, you know, let's do it in the time that it is needed. And then it can come back to us, you know, to, to make sure that we're happy with it. I'm glad Peter did point out that we're not actually voting on the application or whether we agree with it, we're voting on our response. And this is going to be a marathon. It's not going to be a sprint. This is going to be a long, long, long process. Uh, and I really love the comments around us working more with Mendip councillors and them are through Mendip councillors really coming on board with this because this is going to be life changing for Froome, this development. It, it, and I know that as a parish council, all we can do is give our opinion. But you know what, we're, we've always punched above our weight. And I think that if we all work together, we can get the best that we can. And the infrastructure is a huge issue in, in all of this. And the quality of people's lives who are gonna live there and surrounding the area is also enormous. So we're gonna need to all work together. And in the middle of all this, we might end up with a unitary authority as well. So everything might change beneath our feet as well. So I think, you know, I just think it's really important. I want to support Jane on this and support her beefing it up. Um, and I want to work very, you know, largely with other councillors from all authorities going Thank forward. You. Thanks, Max. Um, Andy P and then Paul Houghton. Yeah, thanks, Anita. Yeah, I, again, I, I completely agree. Happy to... Um, uh, give Jane the authority to do uh, do that. She's a subject matter expert and absolute confidence in her to do that. But also, um, I think it's worth remembering, we ought to be bringing in Councillor Bennett and the Selwood uh, councillors to uh, to agree with what we're saying, so. Here, here. Thanks, Andy. Um, Paul Houghton uh, and then Peter. Yeah, I'd like to add my voice to um, to those be happy to delegate uh, Jane to, to kind of beef up this report and change it. I just wanted to add something. that uh, uh, Would it be useful, um, perhaps once Jane's done that, just to kind of run it by a couple of councillors by email or something before sending it off? That's all, really. OK, I'm sure that would be fine. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, Peter, you had your hand up. One of the things we need to consider here is the time scale. In, term, in terms of um, responding to LVA, because uh, I think I'm correct in saying, Jane, you had a um, uh, an extension um, to, to enable this meeting to take place tonight. Um, so what is the deadline that we're working to? Um, I, I think originally we said that we would get the response to them this week, um, although in preparation for this meeting, I did contact them to to ask if they wanted to attend and listen to the discussion. Um, but uh, many of them are on holiday or have other commitments. So I agreed that um, I would contact them next week just to really update them on the outcome of the meeting. Um, so I'm, I'm sure that they would be agreeable to getting something to them mid next week potentially. Okay. But uh, uh, that means that, that there won't be a lot of time for, for consultation on, on the uh, amendments to the, to the response. And, and I really do think that we should ensure that that authority is delegated to, to Jane so that we can meet that deadline. But of course, the decision is yours. And at some point, somebody needs to propose an amendment to this. So maybe that's something we're, we're moving closer to. Okay, many thanks for that. Um, Steve and then Rich, and I think then we need to start talking really about where we're going to go with this. So Steve and then Rich, final words, please. Well, I was going to, I'm happy to propose an amendment that we delegate authority to, to Jane to beef up the report. Um, that's all I want to say. <laughs> Wonderful. That's great. Thank you, Steve. Um, 
quick word, John, and the rich, sorry. Dead quick. I'm just seconding it. <laughs> I don't, I don't think anybody's mentioned the A361, pedestrian access across it, I just, just came to my mind. So if nobody's made that comment, I think it's important there's a footbridge or some kind of traffic light system at some point to access across that. Okay. So, so I'm just seconding um, Steve's thing. Okay, thank you. Andy, quickly, yes, Andy. Uh, yeah, there was a question um, that I felt uh, was um, needs some expanding. So I think David asked um, if the um, beefed up report would be available to the public. I just think it's worth highlighting that, yes, it will be. Um, and uh, it will be on the website. Um, can, can we ask Rachel to, to maybe, um, is there a mailing list that people want to sign up to? Or uh, how do we make that really accessible for people who are interested? Just so it's not missed. Absolutely. Um, it will be on our website. It will go out on social media. It will be in the Free Times. Uh, and we have um, uh, newsletters that people can sign up to called the Town Clerks Update. You can sign up to that on our website and that will make sure that uh, nobody misses any of our news electronically. Thank you, Rachel. Thank so you. Uh, sorry, Peter. I just wanted to, to say, and maybe it's an appropriate point to um, to, to say this, and assuming that, that there's still an opportunity, Jane, wouldn't it be a good idea for, for any of the attendees tonight who, who want to make their own um, comments directly to 12VA that they, that they do so? Um, is, is there still an opportunity for them to do that? Uh Formally, the online consultation has closed, um, but I don't see, I, I'm sure if people were to email them directly, that they, they would still look at their comments. I mean, you know, they're, they're still allowing time for us to submit ours later. I would hope very much that anything that is emailed directly uh, would, would still be taken into consideration. But the consultation itself has formally closed online, so you can't submit your comments online anymore. Thank you, Jane. And uh, do, do you know what email address they need to write to? Is it worth um, making that known tonight? Uh, yes. <laughs> I'll come back to you. We, can, to we can come you. back to it in a, in a little we'll bit before we close, potentially. We'll come back to that one. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious now we need to start wrapping this up. So, um, Steve, you had a um, proposed amendment to the recommendation, which is that we should agree Jane's uh, response as above, but in a very beefed up fashion. Uh, is that, I mean, we'll have to <laughs> word it properly. <laughs> But that's what really the principle of it, isn't it? So yeah, it's it's delegating authority to Jane to to be. It was just to delegate authority, yeah, as per the discussion that we've just had. Absolutely. So can I ask? I mean, Steve's proposed that. Would somebody second that, please? John. Okay. Can I can I just add something? Um, sure. It it's just Paul Horton's point about um, having a couple of people. Um, that Jane can actually just run it past. Does that need to be part of this um, agreement? I mean, I, I, it's going, the recommendation could be something like councillors agree to delegate authority to um, Jane Llewellyn and the, the, your title, I can't remember what it is, um, to, uh, to better reflect the discussion that's happened tonight and um, in consultation or, you know, is, would it be no just to better reflect the con the discussion tonight and leave it at that yes jane uh, i mean it, that, that's the kind of thing that i would normally do as a matter of course anyway um you know i would prefer that somebody else read it b before it was sent so um i'm happy to do that obviously conscious of time scale so it would need to be quite a quick turnaround for you know whoever's looking at Great. it as, as Steve, can I just make a recommendation? I just wonder, as Steve and Sheila are both propose, proposing this, I wonder if they could just be emailed quickly for once over. Would that be acceptable? Sure. I, I think Paul Horton should see it as well, personally. I think so. Because he's okay. deputy chair of BAG and et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Anita, can I, can I just say I'd, I'd be happy if Steve is chair of PAC and... 
Paul as deputy, and if Sheila would like to see it, I think that's that's good. Lovely. Okay. Are you happy with that, Jane? Okay. But, but I presume I presume that we you know we've still got a um, a proposal from Steve seconded by John to to vote on. Indeed, we have. So um, we're voting really on the amendment now. So can you can all councillors please raise their hands in agreement with the amended version? Do you want do you want blue hands, Anita? Oh, uh, no, ordinary hands will do. Sheila, that's fine. Um, that's uh, 14, uh, which uh, is, I think, a uh, majority tonight. Okay. Uh, or is it a unanimous one? Because well, obviously Ali, can, Ali, Ali can't. Ali, Ali can't, and Sarah so can't vote. Yet. Okay, so, so 15. So out, out, of, out of 15, we have 14 voting for okay. that proposal. Anyone objecting? Anyone objecting? Anyone abstaining? No. Uh, I think we've actually just lost Paul Holton, haven't we? So I'm not quite. <laughs> Paul, I think was. I'm not sure which way he would go. But uh, oh, sorry, Paul. No, we've lost Rob. I think no, we haven't. We've got Rob. Who are we it's missing? Just, then? It's just that Abby we, can't vote, so she was correct. Okay. Correct, but we had fourteen, so yeah. that, that's carried. So that carries. Okay. In that case, we now need to uh, vote on the actual new proposal. Is that right? Which that's is right. Uh, now that we're whatever Sheila said. <laughs> what was that sentence you said, Sheila? You said something like, "Councillors agree to um, delegate um, authority to Jane Flewell in planning and." whatever else her title is, um, to uh, re better reflect the discussion that happened tonight. Lovely, okay. So can I have a proposal for that, please? Mark and Rich to second. Thank you. And all in favour? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, Fourteen. Lovely. Uh, four, okay. uh, 14 out of 14 who are able to vote on this. So Fabulous. That's good. Thank you very much, everybody. I think that's been a really inter interesting discussion. It was wonderful to hear so many public viewpoints, and I think we've had a really good discussion as councillors. Um, my thanks especially to Chris Bennett for coming along this evening from Selwood Parish Council. Um, and also, of course, to Jane, who's borne the brunt of all the questions this evening. So thank you so much. Peter for clerking. Thank you. Um, and for everybody who's been helpful, Rachel and uh, Sarah, for managing in the background and for Laura. Thank you very much to everybody. Have a good evening and see you next time. Good night.